Finance is weird in its jargon alone. Ever heard of diamonds, spiders, or cues? Diamonds place you in 30 Dow stocks via an ETF symbol DIA. Spiders are another ETF under symbol SPY that spread your stock investing bets across 500 S&P index stocks. The Qs are the NASDAQ 100 ETF diversified across 100 stocks under symbol QQQ. What these ETFs allow you to do is diversify your stock investing across tens or even hundreds of stocks. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is now traded above 29,000. The S&P 500 spiders have soared to new heights. And NASDAQ 100 QQQ has set a new all-time high. But should you be buying now? Index funds such as the DIA, SPY, and QQQs began in 1976 as a niche product for investors who decided that for at least part of their portfolio that individual firm analysis wasn't worth the effort and expense. Today, there are 1,400 equity index ETFs in addition to the three most important I'm explaining to you now. Wharton finance professor Jeremy Siegel and University of Rochester finance professor Bill Schwert, along with Nobel laureate Bob Schiller of Yale, studied United States stock prices from 1802 forward. Siegel discovered that the worst years crushed a $100 investment down to $61.40 at a negative 38.6% return. But the best year was a 66.6% return, amping a million-dollar index fund position to one million. $666,000 in that one year alone. The good news doesn't stop there. If you buy and hold an index fund for 10 years instead of one, your risk drops substantially. You can own the S&P 500 stocks by purchasing the Spider ETF, symbol SPY, from State Street. Why is this a black belt move for your family finances? Blackjack card counters can drain a casino if they were to play unabated with better odds than a coin toss. How about a coin that wins 97% of the time? Would you take that bet? Imagine a series of overlapping 10-year periods, 1926 to 1935, 1927 to 1936, and so on. S&P 500 stocks scored positive returns 62 times over 64 overlapping 10-year periods from 1926 to 1928. Over 59 15-year period returns were positive every single time. And during the worst 20-year period, the total gain was 84%. Professor Siegel revealed his research to the public in a book entitled Stocks for the Long Run. The worst year from 1802 forward was 11%. The worst five years lost just 4.1%, and the best 10-year gain was 16.9%. The worst 30-year return was a 2.6% gain, where $100,000 grew to $215,980, according to Atlantic Magazine. The article concludes that index mutual funds and ETFs have never failed to double in buying power in a generation. This reduction in risk across the price dimension is interesting, but even more fascinating are insights from volatility. Volatility of stock price returns is measured by standard deviation. This does not vary more than 18% in two out of three years. The inflation-adjusted real return of the stock market is 7%, so two out of three years, you should expect returns between 25 and negative 11%. Single stock losses and gains are even more extreme. That's a lot of risk to the downside, but it's more than balanced out by huge upside gains in other years. I use calls on fast-rising single stocks to increase returns four, five, or more times in the years the market rises. And then I just get out in the years the market's dropping. When I make large amounts of money in the short term, I convert it to a long-term investment buying the Diamonds ETF symbol DIA that diversifies my family wealth I steward across shares of the 30 largest firms in the world. I do this on a buy and hold basis. Again, I don't trade calls when the market's dropping, but I do continue to hold my ETF positions. I do this because Mir Statman showed that I'm fully diversified with 30 stocks in his article in the Journal of Financial and Quantitative Analysis entitled, How Many Stocks Make a Diversified Portfolio? I plan to hold the diversified Diamonds ETF investment for many years because the standard deviation drops 5% in a decade and just 2% over three decades in two out of three periods studied. Surprisingly, a Diamonds, Spiders, 
or Q's ETF long-term buy and hold strategy is safer than short-term T-bills rolled over annually because the worst inflation-adjusted return invested in stocks was 1% annually on average, while Treasury bonds lost negative 3.1% and T-bills lost negative 3%. Stocks outperformed bonds 61% of the years covered, while stocks beat bonds 92% of the 20-year periods and 99% of the 30-year periods studied. Firms manage dividends to levels managers believe they can attain. So dividends don't reflect the auction process that sets share prices, and for this reason, you should ignore dividend yield. Price to earnings fluctuated between 12 and 22% when baby Bush was president. Mean price earnings went from 6 to 25 from 1916 to 1921, dropping back to 11 in 1922. But the aggregate P.E. ratio has risen to a range between 25 and 30 since the Reagan administration. This is slightly below the price to earnings ratio average from as far back as 1870 that's slightly higher at 14. I don't use P.E. ratios in my trading since the only possible buy signal would have been in the super choppy stock markets of the 1970s. But that same bad stock market decade of the 1970s was the worst for stocks, but the best for commodities. The S&P 500 fell 13% in real terms, which is horrible considering that the same index rose by 22% in the 1930s after the Great Crash during the worst of the Great Depression. If you believed that the P.E. ratio in the 1970s was correct, as did many analysts, you would have shunned stocks through the greatest bull market ever. And even then, if you held until the price-to-earnings ratio climbed above its long-run average of 14, you would have sold out of the second phase in the 1980s and missed increasing your money eight-fold. So ignore the price to earnings ratio. A good hypothesis of why the risk premium continues to shrink is because stocks are less risky than bonds in the long term looking back 200 years. So to answer the question I asked at the beginning of this video as to whether or not any of these index ETFs are a buy now, well, the answer is yes. They are a buy all the time as a parking lot for your retirement savings where you get average but good returns. And if you already own indexes, you're happy because the S&P 500's total return was a massive 31.5% in 2019 alone. The DIA, SPY, or QQQ, passively tracks a benchmark index delivering almost all gains less a tiny fee of a fraction of a percent. Index funds are shifting corporate power in America. Let me explain. BlackRock Inc. with iShares Exchange Traded Index Funds is the biggest indexer with $7 trillion under management. Index pioneer Vanguard Group Inc. is second with $5.6 trillion. And third is State Street Corp. managing $2.9 trillion. These big three together index 80% of everything out there. This is concentrated voting power in the big three indexers where 22% of S&P 500 company shares are owned. Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street own nearly a fifth of all Apple Inc. shares, and at 18%, this is nearly double the ownership from 2009. They also own a fifth of the big four banks, Citigroup, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo. And Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street own a third of Cabot Electronics, showing that they own an even higher percentage of smaller firms. But they don't vote as a colluding force, at least not yet. This has pulled shares out of the grasp of actively managed hedge funds that have been shown incapable of beating the market. But even though managers of index funds don't vote directly, they do influence top management through a process called job owning. Nonetheless, the potential combined voting power of the big three have become a target of regulators and academics. Critics claim that this promotes sloth in management and blocks shareholder activism by locking large sections of index fund votes in place. Even the Wall Street father of indexing, John Bogle, expressed concern that index funds could end up controlling the stock market, where today the big three own 22% of the typical S&P 500 company. BlackRock and Vanguard have been shown by financial economists to force election of insiders. Another erudite study showed that BlackRock and Vanguard vote against climate-related shareholder proposals. 
Harvard Law School professor Einar Elhag sees the big three control of indexing as the biggest anti-competitive threat today from institutions that have been shown to adversely affect the pharmaceutical market. And airfare has been shown to be higher when big funds own airlines. Harvard Law professor John Coates asserts that a small number of unelected agents operating largely behind closed doors are increasingly important to the lives of millions who barely know of the existence, much less the identity or inclination of these agents. And finally, now you know why Elizabeth Warren proposes adding employee representatives to boards of the big three indexers.